Endgame lecture brought to you today by the letter E. And who is the highest rated player in the world whose last name starts with E? I'll give you a hint. It's from Eric's home country he's never been to. You, you've been there? You've been to your home country? No. Yeah, I didn't think so. Anyone? The Ukraine is weak. I'm now, sure that I saw the name before. The Herschel. Uh, Pavel Alyanov, the third most famous Ukrainian player after Ivanchuk and former world champion. Ponomaryov. I, I should have said world champion. And this is something you didn't know because you guys don't know anything. Uh, Ponomaryov won the world championship against Ivanchuk. They were the final two. Yeah, I said Ponomaryov would win. And the response was, who's that? So, wait, why is this here? That's good. All right, that's good. All right. That's the funniest thing Arjun ever heard. Okay. Okay, so um, Elianov is one of the world's most boring players. So it was easy to find end games he won because he didn't win in the first 20 moves. Um, he's normally board three for the Ukraine. And now the Ukraine's getting pretty old. So very suspicious next to Olympiad. Okay, uh, he's playing the Indian player Gupta. Uh, and this was a couple of years ago at Aeroflot. Okay, black played, knight takes c5 check, or white did. Now there's a player you've never heard of named Jakob Juchtman. Uh, and he was old, he was born old. He was a very strange guy. And uh, he was always the same age. I think he was like 78 when he was born. And about 100 years later he was 78. And he lived in New York and he was from the old country um, what country I don't know because it was too old. But uh, he had a funny uh, thing that he would do. He lived in New York and he was about 2450 plus tax. And he would play knight in three against knight in two on the same side, although it would be drawn. And then he would play for money and give you draws five minutes each. And he would move around doing nothing for five minutes until your flag fell or you, you'd blunder. Now, this is slightly different because. This pawn on e5 isn't on h7, in which case the position would be a draw with correct play. Now the position is more likely winning because black can get past pawns in the center um, because he has a past pawn already and f5 is going to create another one. So even though this looks like a draw because it's three against two, it's very good winning chances. Okay, so the first thing any strong grandmaster does in chess is what? What's the first thing you do? Oh wait, you're not a strong grandmaster, so you don't know. That's too bad. No, they're ridiculous. Yeah. Would, would, come on, would Nigel Shroy ever do that? Would, 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 would Kramnik and Toplov ever do that? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely not. Okay, the correct answer, which is very obvious, is to repeat. Okay, so black repeated. Okay, you gotta like that. Okay, good. Okay, now you know he's a good player. Okay, and then he played king to d6. Okay, and white forked the king and pawn, as Mike Comer would call it. And then he defended that way. Actually, I have a funny story to tell because I, I get paid by the hour. So I was playing in Michigan a couple of years ago, and I drew in round one against the 1900. Actually, I beat Lenderman that tournament, so the mysteries of life. Anyway, uh, I was a piece down the whole game because I hung a piece. In the end game, uh, we repeated just like this, and I claimed to draw. And my opponent, who was rated like 1970s, like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, the same position occurred three times. And he's like, what does that mean? I'm like, what? So what? So the, the arbiter came. The arbiter was rated like 1300. And he's like, yeah. And the other guy's like, I don't understand what's going on. Like, why aren't we still playing? And I said, well, the game we repeated three times is a draw. And he said, doesn't it have to be three in a row, which I don't even know what that means, because you, you, can't, you can't repeat the same position three times in a row. It's not impossible. So um, I think what he meant was the exact same moves were made, which obviously is irrelevant. So in this position, if black played king e6, then white could claim a draw by saying he was going to play knight c5, but not actually playing it. If you actually play knight c5, then it's your opponent's turn. But if you say you're going to play knight c5, then you could claim a draw. So if that had happened, then I wouldn't be showing you this game. That would be like Elianov's worst end games. Okay, we play king e7. 
Okay, so black wants to play f5, and, and, and so he did. Okay, and then normally when you have fewer pawns, and when I say normally it's the case here, you want to trade all the pawns, and the goal is to get one pawn versus zero, then you're not going to win. Okay, the knight moves away, king protects the pawn. White plays h4, yeah, that pawn's not, not queening. Okay, and unfortunately uh, for white, when he plays h5 check, instead of getting counterplay, he's just going to lose his pawn. So he's sort of pushing it to its doom. King g5, king f2, exclam. Okay, knight g7. Notice how the knight uh, protects the f pawn and attacks the h pawn. And, and white just resigned. Although, if it was knight and two against knight, I wouldn't resign. I would hope for some kind of mistake. Um, but yeah, you're just going to lose your h pawn. So back here, you know, white probably had better chances by not moving his h pawn and just keeping it there and hoping that black would blunder something like e4 check and you sack the knight for both pawns. But Elianov wasn't going to do that. He was slowly but surely going to win, and then he waited for his opponent to just push his pawn to its doom. Now the knight's going to take the pawn, and if you play h6, then you, you, you can't play this. What's funny is, if the white king was on f3, then black, white could actually do that. Um, but with the white king on f2, you can imagine if the white king was on f3 here, that white would play king e4. Then it would be a draw, I guess. Can you mate with a knight? I forgot. Is this the beginner class? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's on Passant? All right. So, uh, so after knight g7, white resigned. Hooray, Elianov. Unfortunately, every Elianov game is like this. 70 moves, his opponent falls asleep. Like, if you were at the Mike Hummer lecture earlier, you saw me sleeping in the back. But I needed that sleep, so. Okay. Now, this is a better end game than the last silly one. This is Elianov versus some guy. Uh, rated 2300, not quite to the 2700 level of, of Elianov. Now, a lot of players would tell you that black has the advantage because black has a passed pawn and white doesn't. But that passed pawn is, is useless. It can't move. It's never going to move. And white's rook is better. White's knight is better. White's king is better. And white's going to push his, push his king side majority and black's just going to defend his weak pawns. So this is a big advantage for white. It's very nice to have your knight blockading a pawn. So the other knight isn't doing anything. OK, so a7's hanging. So his opponent played that move. <laughs> Terrible. OK, now black can't move anything, or else he loses everything. So now white can proceed on the king's side. W one of the things that Elianov is good at uh, which is the trademark of a lot of super grandmasters, is he's very patient. So, you know, like if I tell a joke, most of you falling asleep, Arjun's on the floor laughing, but, he, you know, you, you got to wait. You got to wait for the good jokes, okay? Like you see a movie like Ted 2, okay? The first 20 jokes, not too funny. The 21st joke, now you're talking. And then, okay, 20 more bad You got to wait. You can't just laugh at all the jokes. It's not like the South Park movie where you can. Okay, so... Uh, he's still laughing at everything. Terrible. Okay, so, so, white, so white very patient. E4 advanced the majority. Capablanca would be proud. Never play F6. F5, king F4. White just goes forward. H4, E5. Now white takes with the king. Most weaker players would take with a knight because they like attacking things. And if you take with a knight, then you're attacking the rook. Okay, but actually, I wouldn't move my knight off of c4. That's a great square. And my king's going up the board, which is what I want. King b7, defending the knight finally. Check. g5. If Elianov was a stronger player, he'd repeat, but okay. g5. And, and black can't do anything. White's king is much better than black's. All of white's pieces are better than black's. Takes, takes. Knight b8, finally a good square for the knight. 
Well, I might go to D7. A4. A4 I like because uh, black wants to play knight check, knight B6, kick out the knight on C4, and then push the C pawn. So black, white plays A4, and then he plays king C8 because if he plays knight B6 right away, now the only thing defending the C pawn is the rook. So we could play knight a5 or knight e5. I guess I would go to e5. a5 seems pretty good too. And then I'm attacking the rook. The rook's going to move and I'll take your c pawn. So, so we went back for no reason. OK, good. Mike Hummer will be proud of all these errors. And now after king c8, uh, black has the c7 square for his rook. So now, in the same variation I just showed you, knight b6, knight e5, we could retreat the rook. But now, white prevents knight b6, again, the trademark of a top player. How does white stop knight b6? Yeah? a5. a5. Although he might have played king d5 because I forgot. Either way is funny. That wasn't funny. OK, a5, and, and, and black can't do anything. Don't you feel sorry for black? The knight, the knight can't go anywhere. And, and this rook has to stay defending this pawn. And white didn't just push his majority. That was the beginning. Then he stopped black's counterplay by playing a4, a5. Black can't play knight b6. OK, so he moves his king back and forth. That's exciting. King d5. Uh, the espresso machine has spoken. Now. Knight b6 check isn't so good because there's a pawn on a5. On the other hand, uh, it's sort of hard to move here for black. Ben? Sir? Oh. And I say that lightly. Okay. Yeah. A after a5. X-clam. What happens, what happens after he plays a6? Where's the, the rook go? A6 is legal. Uh, I would move my rook. So Wh where I, I, don't, I don't see how it matters. I wouldn't give it away. So rook b3, anywhere, yeah, anywhere. And now you're giving, and now you're giving away the b6 square, so I can go there later. Nothing wrong with a6. Uh, I guess white could try to, you know, take this pawn, since I don't see what black does about it. I'm sure there's something he does about it. I just don't know what. Okay, so that's what white did. Yeah, so white did what I said. Check. And, and now uh, black gave up because um, knight d6 is going to be annoying. For example, now we're threatening mate. So yeah, good luck with that. And also, uh, well, rook e6 wins. Knight d6 threatens mate. So if you don't make a move, then I, then I do this. And if you take my hanging pawn, then I, I what, oh, that's, I guess g6 was bad. Then, then knight b7 track is a fork. So it's funny, another good thing that a lot of top players do is when they have a plan, which I already showed, rook h1, rook h7, take the pawn, they're like, well, wait a minute, rook e1 check just wins because I'm playing knight d6 and giving checkmate. This is a good example of active pieces Something that Kaidenov and I have talked about a lot, not to each other, well, maybe once to each other. Uh, active pieces are very important, not just pawn structure. And in this game, the last 10 moves of the game, white had a better king, a better knight, and a better rook. And I think the key to this ending was white actually playing a4, a5, stopping knight to b6. And black couldn't do anything. Now, this game is different than the other games because uh, this game is equal, and then in our Kiev, who has about the same rating as Elianov, made some mistakes and, and lost. Now, this is a very interesting position because we have sort of an uh, interesting difference of idea here. White's pushing all of his pawns on the king's side, and then black is like, okay, I'll take them, thank you. So either white's going to gain a lot of space and black can't move, or black's going to take all of white's pawns. 
So black is obviously threatening the a2 pawn, so he defended it. And the queen went to f1, and black is saying, I don't have any weaknesses, I'm going to go attack all your pawns. And white says, thank you for the pawn. And after queen e2, we're, we're threatening everything. A lot of times, in positions like this, both sides take all the pawns, and it's still a draw. But in this instance, uh, white's king is not as safe as black's king. Black's king is, is never going to get checked. And so if we see a situation, which we will, where both sides are queening, black's king is very safe. And since white's moved all of his pawns, his king's not very safe. Well, first we have to defend the bishop, so king c2. And everybody takes everybody's pawns. And queen, yeah, and actually, uh, queen, queen b7 is the losing move. White should have anticipated queen g6 check with the queen coming in, and he could have played queen d7, and then he could have blocked. And I think the computer says this is probably a draw, um, but one mistake and you can lose the game. Queen b7 is a pretty obvious move because it stops black from queening, and it helps us to queen. Unfortunately, there's other stuff going on in the position. And queen check, h5, h4. And, and white decided, no, don't do that. White decided my computer would break. Okay. And then, well, you can see black is queening first because his pawn's on the fifth rank, and white's pawn's on the fourth rank. And if both sides queen, then, then black has checkmate. So for example, if we just queen, like in some movies we've seen, yeah, then, then checkmate's good. Yeah, so white's king is very exposed, black's king is very safe. Okay, so white realized both sides queening is not gonna work, so he played queen f3 to stop the pawn from queening. And now c4 is a very nice move. Uh, it makes the bishop very strong. It helps this queen stop the a pawn. And it sort of puts white's king in a mating net. And so now, with the black bishop going to either a3 or c5, the a, the a pawn isn't very strong for white. So white played b4, which is probably what I would do, because I don't want black to play bishop c5 and stop my pawn. And I have two pawns that can queen now. Unfortunately, the pawn on c4 is really strong. So I think white just didn't see the move c4. Uh, if you take the pawn on c4, then you got nothing. The, the black bishop goes to c5, and I mean, white has no chances to queen anything. Now, the problem with b4 is now black can attack the white king from the other side of the board. So what move did black make here? Queen g6. Queen g6 is, you know, we've seen that before. It's not a bad move. What's that? Queen a1. Queen a1, that's my recollection, but I haven't looked at this game in like 20 years. It was played last year too. Yeah, queen a1. Now we're threatening, queen takes a4 check. So probably should stop that. A5? And he played f5. Yeah, a5 is what I would do. Um, Let's see, if I play a5, I'm foreseeing some kind of queen a3, bishop b4 scenario. Seems like that has to work. Yeah, this, this works. Yeah. Yeah, now I'm going to play queen a3 and bishop b4. That's too bad. So for example, uh, well, this is legal, right? Yeah, and then I take this guy. Now bishop a3 made is annoying. And if you check, Always play bishop f8. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's nothing you can do about that. Because if you play king to c1, I can just do the same thing. And then bishop takes b4 is the next move. And this is pinned here. So yeah, c4 was a great move. And that actually turned the tables. Uh, he played f5. Again, f5 is sort of the mirror image of c4. White's activating his bishop. But OK, he's already losing a pawn. So.
Yeah, and he's, and he's got nothing now, just down a pawn. Check. No queen g7 made its check. Always play bishop f8. And yeah, OK. Somehow he's not resigning. Resigned here, that's a good idea. Yeah, the queen's coming. So that was a funny game because uh, white had a passed a pawn and black had a passed h pawn, but white's king was also exposed. And normally in the end game, you, you don't think about checkmating your opponent, but actually you should always think about it because that's how you win. And so in this game, with white pushing all of his pawns on both sides, I think actually white moved all of his pawns. Yeah, white moved every pawn he had, and, and black's king was very safe. So white's king was getting checked, and there were lots of forks and pins, and black's king just sat on g8. Okay, so he won that game, and that was actually a very important game in a strong tournament, because that guy's not so bad. Yeah, don't give me any of that. You can't tell me what to do. All right, of course, Alyanov's white, because he had black the last game. And so we have to flip the board. Okay, yeah, and again, this is actually like the other Elianov game that he won, the first game we looked at, where he also had four against three on the king's side, and black had an extra pass pawn on the queen's side. Uh, the problem is, what that means is, that pawn, if it's on the second, third, or fourth rank, it's not going to queen. It's on the seventh rank in my queen. And the side that has more pawns has the safer king, uh, and obviously, White's going to try to double on the seventh rank, and White is stopping Black from doing the same. Okay, but first things first, the bishop on e5 is attacked. So he, do, he moved it away. g4, we're going to attack. h4, and there's just like no way to stop g5. It's unfortunate. And he's going to play g5. Yeah. And so Black is defending his f pawn in case of the doubling of the rooks. Black's defending this pawn. Black is stopping g5. Black is just much worse. And here, the fact that white's moving his pawns is actually giving him more space, so his king is actually safer. Okay, bishop d8. Not a good bishop. I, I would, I mean, yeah. this guy has the same rating as me, but who's that guy? So uh, I, I don't play moves like bishop d8 unless my bishop goes to a better square. Uh, if I was black, I would tr like sacrifice my b pawn, trade rooks, and try to draw a pawn down, because I, my position would be pretty good, except I'm down a pawn. And here, I'm not down a pawn, but I mean that's that's just terrible. So I don't I don't deactivate my pieces trying to save a pawn. If my pieces can't move, that's that's much worse than a pawn. Okay, knight d4, and white had a really good idea here that I think black never saw. I think black was really worried about knight f5, or as we say in my class, knight f5. knight f5, and I think black was very concerned about that, and rightfully so. And as you can see, a lot of my students, uh, they say things like, I have a passed pawn. Well, passed pawns are good when you can queen them, but we're on the second and third rank and they can't move, that's just a weak pawn. And, well, bishop on d8 just can't move. It's terrible. Okay, rook b2 attacking a pawn. He defended it. Rook b1 with no idea. h5. Uh, basically, I went backwards and you did that? Wow. I, I blame Mike Kummer. So basically, so I can't go backwards? So white wants to play knight f5 at some point and just making sure that g6 is never playable. Cementing the position, very patient. Okay, and then he puts his rooks on the seventh. Yeah, and now a very surprising idea. Um, it looks like black just sits here and moves his rook around forever, but white has a brilliant winning idea. An idea is based on the fact that this pawn can't move. If you were ever going to listen to me again, if you ever are, this is finally my rule comes to fruition, never play f6. If you thought f6 was bad in your games, it's really bad here. f6 getting checkmated. Well, it's not that you can't just play f6, you can't move the f pawn at all. Because then rook takes g7 leads to mate. 
So how did White take advantage of this? Yeah. No, that answer is better than mine. Maybe after knight d6, I play rook d2, but I'm too old to analyze that. Now you could play rook f7, rook f7, knight f7. That's also good for black. Yeah, knight d6 is good. No, yeah, he played f4 because he's patient. He didn't do any of the winning moves. He's just moving around doing nothing. Yeah. Okay, and then he played knight d4, as you suggested. Yeah. And then, if the knight moves, black plays rook takes rook. So what did white do to stop rook takes rook? King e2, very good. Now, black played nothing. The computer says rook takes knight is the best move. Black found a better move by resigning. If you don't sacrifice your rook with a completely lost position and just save your rook, now we finally play the winning move, knight e6. And we're threatening these two pieces. And if you take, you get mated. Of course, nobody in my class would play checkmate. They would repeat <laughs> and, and then checkmate, obviously. I was playing a guy once, and I had like queen check on h3, and he moved his king, and queen takes bishop on b3. And I'd be up like four pieces. And instead of doing that, I repeated like queen h3 to g4 to h3. And then he resigned while I was repeating. <laughs> and then he said, why didn't you take my bishop? And I'm like, you resigned. <laughs> I could have made you resign earlier. Yeah. yeah, 96, yeah. So this is funny, you know, I mean, probably this is a young player, the guy with black, I don't know who it is. Young players don't want to lose all their pieces. They do anyway, but they just don't want to. Higher rated players, older players, they don't mind losing a pawn if everything's active, if the alternative is to put your pieces here and not move them. Because the B pawn is useless. That's not, that, that pawn didn't move. But having your pieces tied on the back ring where they can't move, you just can't do that, you just lose. So that game looked like a very easy win for white when probably white was just a little better. And it would have made a lot more sense for black to not play bishop to d8 in this position and just lose the pawn. You know, move the rook, I don't know. And then if he takes the pawn, he's not gonna checkmate us. So he's gonna have to win this pawn up endgame. Which may or may not be a win, I don't know. If I was black, I'd hope to draw, and if I was white, I'd play a thousand moves. But the way the game went, black had no hope. His bishop was on d8, and white just did whatever he want, and the pawn that black saved didn't really help him. Like, that pawn's useless. White's pieces are all good. The bishop on d8 is terrible. Again, I would be playing bishop f6 here, giving my pawn away. Although, when the black rook was defending it, if, if white took the pawn, we could trade rooks. And black wants to trade rooks because white's rooks are double in the seventh rank and black's rook is on f8 defending. Terrible. Okay, so that was a nice, nice win for Ilyanov. Nice and boring, like he likes it. Good, good system we got here. Good job. Okay, now this game I like the most um, because it was a draw and, and, and black didn't draw. Also, somehow Elion of his wife, so I don't have to switch the board anymore. Yay. <laughs> All right, so a lot of players in this room would just agree to a draw here because both sides have two connected past pawns, so you wouldn't think there's a lot to do here. Okay, but in fact, uh, not only did black lose, black lost immediately. That's the way to do it. Okay, so what white wants to do is take the pawn on d5. It's check because it's a knight now. See, check. Knight, and it blocks the c pawn. Oh, wait, that's a king. Okay, so the king wants to take the pawn, both sides queen, and white's a pawn ahead. And black can easily stop that by playing what move? King e5. King e5 allows e7, very risky. It does stop my plan, though, so you're still right. But it allows another plan, which is favorable to white. Right, king e5, e7, then white probably wins. Anyone else? Yeah, king e7 to d6, and then you agree to a draw. Yeah. Okay, but instead, black, uh, here you should play king e7. Yeah. Instead, 
black played h5 and said like, well, it's a draw. Okay, king e7 is a draw because if you take, then, then black wins. And if you don't take, then I go king here, king here, draw. And the game would have been a draw. I guarantee it. Black would have played king d6, d7, they would have agreed to a draw. So you have to look out for this. Ne never give up trying to win and never think everything's a dead draw. King e7 is a dead draw. Nobody can win. But after h5, white's not winning, but white's much better. Now it's good to be white. Which move did white play, proving his advantage? King takes d5, and both sides queened. Everybody's happy. Except now white's a pawn ahead. And if black starts checking white a thousand moves in a row, which is the usual way to draw, then my king hides over here and takes your pawns while it's hiding. So white's a pawn up, white's threatening. What's, is this mate? Queen f8's mate? Yeah. Queen g6 is mate, right? Yeah. And that might be it. And queen, yeah, thanks. Yeah, good job. And queen takes h5, wins a pawn over the objections of the computer. Uh, and again, if black goes check, 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 white's king goes and takes the queen side pawns. So black went from a dead draw to a much worse ending, and I'm only guessing that black just didn't see king takes d5. Because if you see king takes d5, you just play king e7 here and there's nothing. You can't play king takes d5 now because it's c3. So terrible move. And Elianov won the better end game. Two pawns to one. And it's not necessarily that white's winning, but white's very close to winning, if not winning. White's pawn is further advanced, and white has more pawns. And here black resigned because if you check, then I interpose the queen. And if you don't check, I queen. And if you stop me from queening, I'll check you and then queen. Question yes, you can always ask questions. Yeah, this is King e5 might, might win and might lose. The only way to figure out is to analyze it. I'm going to play c3, you're going to check, and I'm going to move my king. But I'm not going to tell you where. That would give it away. Yeah. Right, let's go here. I don't know. So now, if you play e7, uh, if, I'm not saying you play e7, I said if. Now, if you were in a previous lecture of mine, where I showed the game Ben Feingold, Miles Artiman. Was I white? Yeah. What's the winning move here for black? If you saw that game, you'll figure it out. Close. King D7. King D7. Yeah. I did something similar against Artiman that he didn't see, so he resigned. Now you, now you got nothing. King D7. I mean, I hate when the opponent does that. Um, so E7 is not so good. F7 looks also not so good, right? So King D6, okay. And then I'm going to play C, I'm going to play that. I agree. And then, okay, you're going to get one of these scenarios, but I don't, I don't think black is unhappy. Black's the one who's a pawn up now. So this is probably a draw, but white's probably not better. Well, I know white's not better because the computer says all zeros after King E7. I guess so, I'm thinking of, is there a situation, maybe a pawn you have to be close to the H file, where there's more of their mate threat with the two pawns on the king, as opposed to those? There are, but as we saw, not there. <laughs> but yeah, and, and, and maybe black saw that, but didn't see king takes d5. And king takes d5 is the same, except the d pawn's gone. We get the same queen and pawn endgame, uh, except white has an extra pawn instead of being down a pawn. So H5 was, was really terrible. Yeah. And there are situations where you do that, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. An example at the chess club here, I'm sure you all remember, snicker, snicker, was the game Karpov Sarawan match game one from their blitz match. They played like two slow games and two rapid games. Those are all draws. You guys remember that, right? No. R right. That's <laughs> correct. And then they played blitz. They played like 10 blitz games, something like that. The first blitz game, Sarawan had a winning king upon ending, and he lost, and it was just like this. 
there was like both sides queen and there was a maid and it, they both had like five seconds left. So he made whatever the worst legal move was ever. And probably that game's in the database, even though it's a blitz game because we recorded them on DGTs. So you'll actually see an example of this where one side was winning and they lost. And yeah, Yester was winning and he lost. The rest of the match didn't go well. He did a Carlson before Carlson did it. And least but not last was actually a good player, uh, although an is a good player, uh, Votacek. And this is very surprising because this looks like the most drawn of all drawn positions. In fact, some people would think white's better, and it's too bad Aviv's not here, because Aviv will be here on Sunday for a couple weeks. Uh, v Friedman, your favorite lecturer? Yeah. Um, yeah, he's actually an FST, and uh, Barnes Jewish said he was fine, so you'd have to worry about that. Man, what a slow audience. And I saw you got it right away. Yeah, immediately. Yeah. People at home are still confused. There are people at home who will get it tomorrow. They'll be like, oh, man. OK, now, the reason I mentioned Aviv wasn't because of you know, his obvious you know, deformities. It was because Aviv had an ending very similar, except there were no B pawns. And the other guy's rook was on B5. So like white was just killing it. Like black was struggling to draw. And he en ended up winning the end game. Like it was impossible, but he won. Like there was a white rook here. And this rook couldn't move on a7, but he won anyway. OK. Now here, black is actually better. Because there's something more important than the rook activity in this particular position. There's actually two things that are more important. One is obvious, king activity. And one you don't know, because you know. That's why you're lower rated than I am. No, one is the advanced placement of the pawns. In fact, Alex Yermolinsky, who's, you know, he's been wrong before, but he's probably not wrong here. He said that's the most important. Of all king and pawn and rook and pawn endings, Yermolinsky likes when the pawns are close to queening. I'm not sure why. Oh, yeah, he likes to queen. Yeah. Okay, and, and obviously, this pawn is the closest to queening. That's on the fifth rank. And you're not taking that pawn. So while white is busy taking this pawn, and I'm busy taking that pawn, my pawn's on the fifth rank, and your pawn's on the fourth rank, and my king is active, and your king's on g2. So this is a big advantage for black, even though the computer wants to shut down. It's still a big advantage for black. Doesn't matter. See? It goes away. It's like, all right. Okay. And, and black plays king e4 and gets his king up there. Now, there's nothing white can do. Obviously, Black's king can't run over and take the B pawn because white is stopping that. But there's no way to stop my rook from taking the pawn. And OK, white's going to win this pawn. I'm going to win this pawn. But my pawn's further advanced. And more importantly, my king is on e4. And your king is a spectator. So actually, white, black won fairly easily. Rook c4 check, moving his king. f4, what kind of counterplay is that? OK, now the black rook swings over and takes the pawn on b2, or b3. King h3. So obviously, if I take, I'm going to go take with the king. And then my king is attacking your pawn, and I'm queening. So white is like, you're not going to take with your king. I'm going to leave my rook here. So he activated his king. He's going to try to you know, act, you know, get some counterplay over here. King d4 with a fork. Rook takes a5. Rook to e7. Now, that move shocked me, because I was expecting rook takes b3 when I looked at the game earlier. But after rook e7, there's no counterplay against these pawns. And there's no defense to king c3, king takes b3. That's a real professional move, rook e7. If rook takes b3, which is also good for black, now white has really good drawing chances. Because this pawn's going to fall. My king's moving up. I have a passed pawn. But after rook e7, there's no way you're going to win these pawns. My king's going to do this. And the white king's not doing anything. Black's king is helping the b pawn queen. It's attacking the a4 pawn. And as Gregory Kaidanov said to me once, black is up a king. Actually, I was black against him in the game he's talking about. so. He did say that. I was playing Kaidanov once at the US Championship in Tulsa. Hold on a second. <sighs> Thinking of Tulsa. D don't go to Tulsa. Anyway, 
Ugh. I'm playing the next championship in Tulsa, and I was down two pawns in the rook and pawn ending. That was the best I could hope for in any game. But I, my king was active, and his king was on h1, and I drew. And he said, yeah, you can't win without a king. I was down a king. OK, so black gets his king active, stops the a pawn. Yeah, and then white's got nothing. Uh, here comes the pawn. And if we play something like king g4 or king h4, then I can play rook check and rook b4. So that would be inadvisable. So g4, now black's threatening rook to b4, getting a queen. So white has two choices. He can take the pawn. What else can he do? Resign. Resign. So he chose the resigning one. It, well, rook b4, you're a queen ahead. So you can't let that happen. The problem is you can't play g5 and start running with your f pawn. That, that doesn't work out too well. Okay? And if you don't play g5, you're going to have to lose 800 tempi with your king. And that, you got nothing. Yeah, you got, yeah. And then if you want to be super precise, I'm not saying you do want to be, I'm saying if you want to be super precise, then you go here. That's really mean. Right. If you don't want to be super precise, you go here. And if you want to be sort of like boring about it, you go here. Or you could let it be white smooth and white can resign. Also good because you pin the pawn. And rook check wins and every legal move wins. Okay. So that was very nice by Eliana because when the game started, it wasn't even clear who was better here. This looks like four against four. White's rook is better than black's. But with black's king being better, and with the trade of these pawns favoring black, black's pawn is closer to queening. Black's king is much closer to white's pawns. Black's king is helpful and white's isn't. And my favorite move of the game, rookie seven in this position, just rookie seven. Stopping white from taking the g pawn, but white, black still wins the b3 pawn. Temporarily, black's a pawn down, but he wins easily. And that was against a pretty good player. Votacic, as you all know, I actually think one of you knows. I can't, yeah, I look at him nodding. Doesn't even know the question yet, and he still knows the answer. What? No, no, he, he knows the answer. Votacic was who's second in the World Championship match? Yeah, Vichy, yeah. So he's not as bad as he plays. Yeah. I think everybody was Carlson second. Yeah. Anyway, Anand is on fire. As you know, he's number two in the world now by rating 0.6 ahead or 0.1 ahead or something. Um, and Elianov, unfortunately, even though he's always over 2,700, he's sort of overshadowed by Ponomaryov and Ivanchuk because they live in the same country and they're better than him. So he's, he's the third banana. He's the Wesley So of the Ukraine, except, except Wesley So is number th top 10 in the world. So he gets a little more props. In fact, he's number eight in the world. Usually, when you're number eight in the world, you're not number three in your country unless it was 1950s, 60s Soviet Union. Then you were number nine in your country and you were number eight in the world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that was a, a tough country. You could be the world champion, kick off the Olympiad team. Yeah. <laughs>